Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. We have finally come to 1990. We are in the 90s, ladies and gentlemen. And we're at issue number 10 of Nintendo Power for January and February of 1990. we got a lot of games to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Batman. Unfortunately, the cover is also taken from two publicity stills for the film and put together very haphazardly. Consequently, it doesn't quite work right. In the letters column, we get a question about the fluctuation in size of Mario's nose. Okay. Our first game this is issue, in terms of game articles, is the new Batman game from Sunsoft, which is a loose adaptation of the first Tim Burton film in the form of an action platformer. The game uses a few characters from the comics who don't appear in the film, like um, Firefly, to pad out the game, and the article itself gives maps of the first three stages. From a gameplay standpoint, the controls are rock solid and the platforming is excellent, with my only complaint with the jump being that it's not as precise as what I'd prefer, something a little closer to Mega Man's jump. Otherwise, moving, th moving through the levels is incredibly smooth, and the game has the most organic-feeling triangle jump of any NES game I've played just thus far for this series. I almost wish that NES Strider had come out after Batman in the hopes that Capcom would have learned something from how Sunsoft implemented the triangle jump here and used that to fix the moves problems in Strider. That said, the game is fairly difficult in a tough but fair fashion. Some of the obstacle placements in the first couple levels, especially stage 2-2, require some pretty precise jumps, which will take some practice for players. Next up is Shadowgate, a point-and-click adventure game, and the first in this genre to come out for home consoles in the U.S. In Japan, this genre had gotten a much more considerable amount of support before this, including the highly successful Portopia series of murder mysteries. Unfortunately, this game's gameplay just isn't very good. Shadowgate is pixel bitchy as hell, and the low screen resolution doesn't help things at all. You will die regularly in this game, meaning you'll need to save early and save often. Honestly, I can't recommend this game. You'd be much better off picking a more recent adventure game for PCs instead of playing this one. Hyping Mario 3 is now in high gear with an article on the making of Super Mario Bros. 3. The article gives stories and discussions of what inspired Miyamoto to create some of the new enemies and discussions about what went into designing the various levels in the game, complete with some pictures of the planning uh, sketches for the levels. We also get a full profile of Miyamoto himself, the first pro profile of a game developer we've had in the magazine in quite some time. Next up is the continuation of the strategy guide for Willow, now with the screenshot maps that I wish they'd included last issue. However, because I've already reviewed this game, I'm not going to review it again. Next up is Double Dragon 2 The Revenge. It's The Revenge because they killed Marion off-screen, and now Billy and Jimmy have to get payback. We get info on the first five levels, which also show that the platforming is back. I'm not a big fan of Double Dragon 2's premise. Killing Marion, particularly like this, comes off like the whole women in refrigerators thing. I mean, I don't know how well the idea of just having the Double Dragons go out to defeat the Shadow Warriors without any provoking incident would play in Japan, where the game was developed and presumably was their original art audience they were marketing it for, as opposed to Japan and the U.S. Um, but there's kind of a better way to handle this. I mean, as it is, since Marion's death is completely off camera from a game... Um, as far as what we see in the game, you could theoretically just have Marion not have been killed. You don't need to avenge her death, because she's not dead. The Double Dragons go, alright, we've had enough with the Shadow Warriors, we're going to clean them out. Or something. There's going to be a better way to do it than this. Well, Double Dragon 2 plays about the same way Double Dragon 1 did, which means it doesn't play very well. This is honestly a game that would work better with a 3-button or 4-button controller. One button attacks right, one attacks left, and one button jumps. Maybe tossing in, if you did a 4-button controller, uh, a block button. As it is, this game could be fun, in theory, but I didn't have fun playing it. Honestly, I prefer 16-bit brawlers in terms of how well they play than most 8-bit brawlers, with the exception of one other game that I'll be looking at later this issue. 
Now, next is Super Spike V-Ball. We had a 5-on-5 volleyball game earlier in our path through the magazine, and now we have a 2-on-2 beach volleyball game. The last volleyball game held up well, with the exception of some control problems related to the camera and the whole process of translating volleyball from a real sport to a video game. The article doesn't hold up well, though as it uses a whole bunch of white text on light blue, which is just poor layout design. For shame, Nintendo Power, you should know better. As it stands, for as far as the gameplay is concerned, Super Spike V-Ball has all the same problems of the earlier game. The big difference is, now that it's a two-on-two game, it's harder to quickly ship your characters to counter spikes, making spikes much more of a more low-risk attack than they would be in real volleyball. Also, I'm not sure how the game determines which player you're controlling and when it switches from one player to the other. Still, the game is fun, and I would say the game would certainly be more enjoyable either played two-player co-op or with four players because the game supports multi-tap. Next is Clash at Demon Head, a semi-nonlinear action platformer that handles its semi-nonlinearity a little differently than Bionic Commando did. Because of this, the game isn't exactly conductive for level maps, but is conductive for general tips and some screenshot stuff. From a gameplay standpoint, Clash at Demon Head focuses a lot more on exploration than Bionic Commando did. The game handles sort of the Metroid style of use an item to bypass an obstacle form of nonlinearity, combined with the Bionic Commando style of dividing the world up into routes between intersections. The game isn't without its problems, though. Passwords are obtained through using expendable items items to radio in for the password. These items can be bought at shops, which are found on specific routes, or you can radio in to get a shop brought to you, but the shop summoning items are also expendable. This makes things kind of iffy. Otherwise, the game generally controls very well, though I'm a little annoyed by the fact that you can't get a running start on your jump, so you could theoretically jump further. Next up is the semi-RPG brawler, River City Ransom, complete with a list of all the special moves and tips for how you can beat some of the bosses, and even a discussion of what you need to do to buff up your character appropriately before a boss fight. Now, River City Ransom is my favorite 8-bit brawler. The controls are great, and the designers didn't include any of the unnecessary platforming that the Double Dragon games had. The RPG-like elements are even done in an interesting fashion. By using items uh, purchased with money that's dropped by enemies to level up your character's stats to boost your um, to boost everything, it provides the character and the player more freedom and more options for how they want their character to develop and improve than most traditional RPGs do. If you want to focus more on punch attacks, then you pick up items that boost your punch, or you purchase items that boost your punch ability. If you want to focus more on kicks, same sort of thing. It really makes the game much um, more worth checking out than in any of the Double Dragon games are. In the top 30 column, Marble Madness, Strider, and Metal Gear have entered the list. Next we have our poster, and normally I don't talk about the posters, but this one's worth mentioning. We have a complete map for the city for, uh, from River City Ransom, Ransom, complete with information on what shops are where, what they sell, and what those items do to improve your stats. Next is our Game Boy section, and we don't have any featured games this issue, just a whole bunch of little short previews. Though some of these previews are kind of interesting, we have a look at the first party Game Boy Golf game, the Sokoban clone Boxel, and the first party uh, vertical scrolling shoot 'em up Solar Striker. The Super Mario Bros. 3 hype continues even more with a preview of Super Mario Bros. 3, but as there's going to be a much more in-depth feature later on that I'm already aware of, I'm going to hold off until then. Next we have Burai Fighter, which is a jetpack shoot-'em-up from Taxan. For those who are unfamiliar with the concept, jetpack shoot-'em-ups are shooters where instead of controlling a spaceship, you control a guy who's got a jetpack. This means that you have a dramatically larger sprite than in most other games, but they try to compensate for this by letting you shoot in about eight directions. I wouldn't be sure if I consider that consider that a fair trade, though. Next is Ast- 
De- Ask Deanax. I, I don't know if I pronounced that right, or if that can be pronounced at all, which is a... It's a fantasy action platformer from how, from Jellico, which I hope gets a full preview later. I also hope that somebody gives me information on how you pronounce it later, because I got nothing. You then have Dino Wars, which us is in the 90s with a game that replaces an S at the end with a Z. The game itself looks like what you get if you try to make a Godzilla game without the license. I almost thought this might be like a Zords game or something like that, or at least what was born in Japan is a Zords game, but no, no, this is this is just dumbness. In Howard and Nestor, uh, Howard has come to Tintago Castle, searching for the Stone of Sunlight. Now, he could use the side door into the castle's dungeon, as Howard suggests, but nah. Anything worth doing is worth overdoing poorly. This, thus far, is the best Howard and Nestor strip. It's going to be tough to top this. In the Counselor's Corner column are most notable questions about how to find the city of Ambrosia in Ultima so you can jack up your stats without leveling up and causing tougher enemies to spawn. In classified information, we have a password for Kid Icarus that makes Pit invisible. It would have been nice to know about that when I was reviewing the game back in the Nintendo Fun Club news days. There is a uh, feature article or preview article on the other of notable winter new releases. Of note here is the helicopter action game Infiltrator and the chess sim the chess the chess master, both of which I suspect are PC ports. Uh, speaking of PC ports, in the video shorts column, we have a blurb on the upcoming NES port of another one of Koei's strategy games, Genghis Khan. In the NES journal column, there's an article about the winners of one of the past uh, player's poll drawings getting a tour of Nintendo's offices in Seattle, and we get some, but not all, of the dates for the 1990 Nintendo World Championships. In the celebrity profile, we get a Profile of Stephen First, who has just come off the TV show St. Elsewhere. Nowadays, though, he's probably better known for playing Veer Koto on Babylon 5. And in the Pack Watch column, we have a blurb and some stills of the upcoming new Contra title, Super C. For my picks of this episode, on the two-player front, I'm going to go with Super Spike V-Ball. It's definitely a game which had which provides plenty of opportunities not just for competitive uh, multiplayer, but also cooperative. And I think this is definitely a game that could go well in a party environment, or just a, you and your a buddy, roommate, whatever, that's trying to go through the game cooperatively and seeing as well as seeing how far you can get. On the single player front, I'm going to go with River City Ransom. It is, frankly, my favorite 8-bit brawler, as I mentioned earlier. And actually, I've got to say, this game was a close run, close second for my two-player pick as well, because it's really strong uh, two-player, really good for giving interesting ways for you and your buddy to play the game together, whether it's using your using the other player as a weapon or numerous other things. Well, next issue, things going to change up slightly. It's, it's a normal issue, Nintendo Power, but starting here, Nintendo Power starts making a shift from being a bi-monthly magazine to a monthly magazine. Sort of. Why sort of? You'll have to wait till next time to find out. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up. I'll see you next time.